<clears throat> uh, you can start by turning to Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13. I'm going to have a look at a couple of aspects of the promised land and how it relates to us. And um, so we'll actually, I know what I was going to do. This here. All right. So um, I'll get you to look at this uh, map. I'm not sure how, I'm not certainly um, fluid in history, but um, it's called the Proclamation Line of 1763, and it's detailing how um, in the early settling of the United States, um, there was a particular phase where they had to divide up the land and in different ways, and um, in this way, uh, they, they just picking out a little tiny piece of this this kind of thing here, and they it was um, I think it was the British at the time decided that you know the Indian country or the the Native Americans uh, they wanted to sort of separate them and have separate pieces of land to live in. So that's the green there, and um, and then the the people from Britain, you know, were given that land um, to the east of the red line with all the states we know today. Of, co of course, they didn't look like that back then. But um, uh, and so this was done to have these two different peoples um, living peacefully separately, though. And um, and you know, the dividing line was the Appalachian Mountains, essentially, obviously, it didn't go doesn't go down to Florida, but um, the general idea was the the Appalachian Mountains there. And you can see there's um, some other stuff going on there. Um, about it's called, it says there on the western side, Spanish Louisiana, and then there's West Florida. So I just want to talk today about borders and territory. And a little bit about um yeah this kind of thing with respect to i guess using the promised land as an example and so we're going to come back to this but first we're going to start in numbers chapter 13 and i think i had a slide about the, the promised land and so we're reading here about the time when um the spies were sent out into the land of canaan which was the promised land. So verse one of Numbers 13, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel from each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sent them from the wilderness of Paran according to the command of the Lord, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel. Now, it goes through and it says all the names and, and the tribes that will skip down to verse 16. These are the names of the men whom uh, Moses sent to spy out the land. And Moses called Hoshea, the son of Nun, Joshua. Then Moses sent them to go spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not, be of good courage and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Zin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamath. And they went up through the south and came to Hebron and all these other places. Um, and it says that the descendants of Anak were there. 
and down to verse um, 23, then they came to the valley of Eshol, uh, which I think is a word that means clusters and says, um, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes. They carried it between two of them on a pole. They also brought some of the pomegranates and figs. The place was called Oh yeah, here it says it. The place was called the Valley of Eshol because of the cluster which the men of Israel cut down there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days. And um, now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, we went to the land where you sent us, it truly flows with milk and honey, and this is the fruit. Uh, sorry, this is it, its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong, the cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw def descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains, and the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Um, and so we, we know that um, in the next chapter how it goes, that the, you can read it for yourself, but um, that the congregation of Israel was not keen to to do what the Lord said, which was to go in and, and claim the land. And I wanted to just um, pick out some things, some thoughts of this passage to talk about, um, to try and relate it to us. And it says there that they, the spies were to go in the land for 40 days. And you think, um, so why? Why did God send, tell Moses to send spies into the land to suss it out for 40 days? Why didn't he just say, right, now's the day we're going in to claim the land? There was this time of 40 days where um, God wanted them to see, you know, what is the land like? What are the people like? What's the forest like? All that kind of thing. And I believe it could be likened to the fact that um, when when we're spirit filled, when we're saved, when we have that initial revelation of how to follow the Lord and how to be right with Him, um, that is, you know, that's the start of that's a conversion experience. That's a um, infilling of the Holy Spirit, and then comes the time of testing while we live on this earth and the times of trial and tribulation. Now, of course, there's trials and tribulation before you get saved, but now there's a context to it of where God has promised you have an eternal future and he has you in his hand and there's a certain outcome from it, but you've got to go through this testing period, if you like, where all you have to do is walk in his ways and do all the things that he's said to do and he's told you the outcome he said it will be great and what could be so hard about that but for mankind it seems to be quite hard um and so it's similar here where he sent out the spies and he said you know it was almost like look at look at what you're going to inhabit and look at what you're going to conquer right so if you see scary things that that's fine i've said you're going to conquer all those those people and um you know come back and and maybe you know 
have some plans and some observations, but know that the Lord God is going to see you through and overcome these things. And so it's very similar to us that, you know, it's a time of demonstrating faith right now where there's no, it's not a, it's not a thing which we can't understand. It's not a thing where we don't know the outcome. We don't know what to do. It's all, it's all laid out for us, how to follow the Lord. And, um, I was also thinking uh, about um, how did the spies actually, if you keep your finger in numbers, because we might turn back to it, I think, but turn to Isaiah chapter 46. Um, I was thinking about how, how did the spies survive those 40 days? You know, um, Closest thing I've read is a book called, I think it was Bravo 2-0 or something like that, about the English SAS being dropped behind enemy lines somewhere in, I don't know if it was, it was one of the wars anyway. I think it was the first Gulf War. Very fascinating how they tried to um, evade capture and, you know, they're flying in these helicopters at like really low levels, so they evade radar and then they're dropped off and then they're, they're in the enemy territory. And they're, they were, they're able to roam around and not be caught. It's quite amazing. And so obviously the Lord's hand was in this as well with, with the spies. And um, seemingly impossible. But um, when the Lord says something, he stands by it. And in Isaiah 46, verse 10, it says, um, or well, start in verse... Uh, nine perhaps remember the former things of old for i am god and there is no other i am god and there is none like me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done saying my counsel shall stand and i will do all my pleasure and the lord promised to abraham and he promised to his people a thing a, you know he he made an oath he made a promise and it says here that he declares the end from the beginning. And he, so he not only promises, but he says how it's going to go down. He says how it's going to, how it's going to end, what the, you know, the victory will be like. And um, it's, it's funny, you know, because even uh, it said in, the, in numbers there that he even sent in the spies right at the perfect time of the grape season, you know, where they could get the best fruit. He didn't send them there in, um, in the dead of winter. I don't know if there was snow there, but he didn't send in there when it was harsh and it would be even more of a test. But he sent them in there in the, in the right time where he could show them the fruits of the land and they could be even inspired by that. And so our God does not, is not a harsh God. He's not testing us with, he's not withholding stuff from us in order to make it even more of a challenge or more of an obstacle. He, he gives us all the tools we need and even more so in this day and age where we can be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so um, that's the first point. Um, then I was also thinking about, well, it's kind of related to the point I was just making, but I was thinking about this idea of conquest and all the history that's happened over the last over the centuries and, um, you know, those, uh, the countries that were very active in sending out explorers. And I think the British and the Dutch and the Spaniards and, and all these kinds of things where they're trying to find new places. And, and again, it's just thinking about how the Lord sent the spies in when, when the land was good, when the, when the fruit of it was obvious. And, uh, I think I've got a picture here. That's, that's Australia when the Dutch arrived and who else, I don't know how many different people arrived. Does anyone know? I don't know my history that well, but I'm pretty sure it was more than the Dutch that rocked up the French. And so, um, even, um, you know, I think the people who eventually decided to settle, I think this, you know, it's on the East coast or something, you know, but, um, I'm from Western Australia and on the West coast, there was tons of people rocking up and looking around and just be like they, that's what they saw and they're just 
I think it was north of Perth, so there wasn't even any water or river or anything. And they're just horrified and um, and some of them left and were able to leave, but a lot of them perished, um, shipwrecks and all that kind of thing. And you just think people were rocking up. They could have had a whole whole continent, really, if you, if you think about it. And um, they saw this and saw that there's no value to this land. Um, but now what we find is that there is a lot of value. I think um, there's a mine in Western Australia that I think it mines like a huge amount of the world's lithium, which is highly sought after now. I think it's over 90% or something. So there's like one mine in the world that's getting all the lithium that runs all our electronics and all that kind of thing. And it's in a place like this. And so it's not, it's sort of like what you see is not what you get. Um, there can be value there. And um, I was also thinking about Canada's, well, to me, Canada's that way as well, because it's covered in snow. I don't know if <laughs> Canada was actually thought to be um, a wasteland and all that, but so I, I did look it up and I found this article, um, once thought to be a useless desert, Pallas, so that's him on the right there, Pallas's triangle has long been the breadbasket of Canada and it talks about, um, about there being inferior pasture, inferior soil in this article, I won't read it out, but you know, this massive amount of, I think Canada's the largest country in the world, right? And so massive amounts of loose tracks of sand constantly moving in the winds, um, impassable sand hills, and um, poor for farming, etc. And so now we know, again, that it's all different now. Like you think of even the Arctic and the Antarctica, where probably a hundred years ago, people couldn't care less about that land. Now everyone's rushing to get a piece of these lands that um, that were maybe considered not valuable. And so now they're very sought after because of minerals and um, and and so you know. It's the same with the children of Israel, if you think like they were, they were told that the land was good and they were you know, told by God, what an advantage, you know, that um, they had been given the promises. And I guess my main point here is that God is not, he's not a sneaky God. He's not hiding things from us. He's not, you know, um, I did this escape room thing. I've done one here, but in, I did one in UK when I was there and it's all set up to be tricky and challenging and hard and uh, to trip you up. And, you know, you, if you go to one of those things, you pretty much always have to pick up the phone and get a hint or whatever, because they've set it up to be that way. They've set it up to be difficult. Um, and it just, it just astounds me that that's not how God is. And yet look at our world and the overwhelming majority of people are, are lost and not following his ways and they're um, and clueless when it's it's all laid, laid out for us. All we have to do is surrender our own will and enjoy a great life in the Lord. Um, turn to Exodus chapter 23. An example here of where the Lord laid it out. So we're turning backwards here. Exodus chapter 23, verse 31. And I will set your bounds from the Red Sea to the sea of Philistia and from the desert to the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the, the land into your hand and you shall drive them out before you. So God here, as I said, an example, he's stating the promise in advance. He's stating the mission, the result, everything like that. Um, the result was clear. And um, and you can read even, um, we won't turn to it, but in Numbers 34, it also it describes the borders of the, um, the land that they would inherit. And um, verse... 25 of this chapter it also says let's see here so verse 
So you shall serve the Lord your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. No one shall suffer miscarriage or be barren in your land. I will fulfill the number of your days. He's saying, you know, they're going to live long. They're going to be in good health. What an amazing promise that the Lord sets up for his people, and yet um, mankind struggles to sort of stay within the boundaries of you know, here is perfection, here is joy everlasting, here's your future. But mankind wants to escape the borders. And um, I wanted to talk a, bit, a little bit about borders for a second. Um, driven by, uh, let's see if it's the next slide, this place for, gee, the long by me to Georgia, 18 years or something. And it's, it's a marker called Cherokee Corner, and it's where the arrow is pointing on 78. And it's, it's uh, unfortunately, Cherokee Corner, the name that it's known for now is, is terrible because it's, a, it's this um, weird S. But it's actually just a curve, and it's um, extremely dangerous, and people, multiple people die there and crashes every year. And the, the uh, roads department's known about it for years. They have had plans 30 years old to fix all these problems and these deaths. But anyway, that's another story. So you can't really stop and read this because it's there's no parking, there's no there's a ditch in front of it, and it's a high speed corner and people are dying, but I guess you can pull up the photo of it. And um it's it's a very historical place. Um it talks about a tre treaty there, but I'll read something here to describe it. And um, it says, before 1771, the Cherokee Indians were so indebted to the government trading post at Augusta that the government demanded um, that they settle the debt by ceding more land to be open for settlement. The Indians reluctantly agreed. Accordingly, about 1775, a party of government surveyors and Indian chiefs state, uh, started from a point some miles above Augusta on the Savannah River and made their way westward. And they reached a grove of great white oak trees by Indian Trail leading southward from the Appalachian Hills to Greensboro. And the old Indian leading the party stuck his tomahawk into a great white oak and said, we go no further. So they turned southward from here, making this corner of the line. And since this time, the place has been known as Cherokee Corner. And so this was essentially a point, a border point. Um, and Arnoldsville was created after that, you know, it was a trading post and stuff that the town of Arnoldsville, where I live. And, uh, and yeah, so it was a, and, and then there's, if you've heard of Bartram's trail, I think he's a Pennsylvanian, uh, botanist and so he's come through and there's a historical trail there about him um finding all this stuff about seeds and i think he's like the the number one historical botanist in the u.s he changed a lot of things and discovered a lot of things going down to florida in the 1700s i think um and so um you think okay that's interesting and then you look at this map the indian where the Indians gave territory, and I, I'm not going to get into the, I don't even know why the whys of it, but they, they were indebted somehow, and then they had to give land. So I don't know if that was a was sort of part of the plan or whatever. But you can see here the numbers there, just constantly seeding land, and it creeping in, creeping in, and um, at some point there you can see the years. The that first map I showed the uh, proclamation line. You know, at some point that merged in with this, um, but there was just this constant moving of the borders and and the changing of power and and things like this. This is my one and only Pastor Warren Sharrock talk, by the way. Um, it's my attempt; probably will never happen again. Uh, so now it goes further. This is, um, there's a Creek Indian tribe and then up the north is a Cherokee. I think those are the two main Indian tribes and just 
constantly the borders moving and having to give up. And I don't know, I'm sure there was fights and skirmishes and wars, I don't know. But um, this continual moving of borders and boundaries. And land that they were inhabiting, you know, peacefully, and then suddenly they're not inhabiting it anymore. When, when it comes to mankind, it seems a border is, is not a border. It doesn't actually mean anything. If you look at the conflicts and we expand outwards to the US, um, I, I just learned all this stuff for this talk, but like this place called West Florida here, um, a lot of history there. It was a fight between Spain and the USA. Um, I was going to... I forgot to put a map of the Louisiana Purchase in, but you can see it's written there on the left. So the Louisiana, that's a huge piece of land. You think it's just Louisiana, the state today, but no, it was a massive piece of land. And I found this quote, this quote about it, about the Louisiana Purchase. And it says, even before Louisiana was acquired by the United States, President Thomas Jefferson began to press American claims further afield. He asserted that Louisiana embraced all of the lands drained by the western tributaries of the Mississippi River, including the far-flung and uncharted headwaters of the Missouri. By 1823, when the last bonds issued in Great Britain and the Netherlands for financing the purchase were paid off with the interest by the United States Treasury, the total spent for Louisiana amounted to about $23 million. And it says, as if sympathetic to President Jefferson's assertions, the boundaries of Louisiana expanded and adjusted over time until they eventually stretched from the Gulf of Mexico to British America, present day Canada, so all the way up to Canada, and from the Mississippi River to the Rocky Mountains. So summing up massive amounts of history in a little bit, but you know, that always that pressure from the American president there to expand and, and claim more land. And now I was thinking about water disputes across the world. So this is 2017. And then I looked at a list of them, uh, a list of all current border disputes, and you wouldn't believe what's going on. I mean, there's stuff between the US and Canada that's disputed up in the, I don't think the Niznanskis are on, but Nova Scotia and open disputes, you know, and then there's stuff in the Caribbean with between different countries claiming different places. So most of the world is under some kind of dispute and some of it's obviously latent and just sitting around. Um, but mankind never satisfied, it seems. The, the um, Kashmir dispute, India and Pakistan is a big one. Um, but many of them you wouldn't know. And then bringing it back locally, um, thinking about the stuff that goes on in our neighborhoods and the crazy stuff that it's, it doesn't matter if it's countries or, or um, our houses, you know, and this is where, uh, obviously you can read the title, Mansour's Neighbours Garage in Half, Mid-Boundary Dispute. Here's another one, Officials Split Building in Two to Solve Property Dispute. And so it just gets ridiculous. Um, so turn back to Numbers Chapter 23. Numbers chapter 23. It's just a difference between, you know, mankind and God's word and, and promises and um, commitment and oaths. And it says in verse 18 of Numbers chapter 23, then he took up his oracle and said, rise up, Balak, and hear, listen to me, son of Zippor, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed it, and I cannot reverse it. So we forget these things sometimes. We, we think that God's not hearing, he's not listening, he's not acting. But we're in this time of testing, and uh, the point isn't to snap our fingers and have everything change in an instant it's to be enduring and patient and um, trusting and the lord will deliver and he will 
make a victory. And he's, you know, these words are very powerful, but we sort of sometimes forget them and sometimes uh, act as if they're not true. Like God is not a man that he should lie and he won't repent. He don't say something and then roll back his word. He won't do that to us. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we see here Paul providing a warning to us about the ch from the children of Israel. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. <clears throat> now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. And do not become idolaters as were some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did and in one day 23,000 fell, nor let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents, nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Um, so again, the, it's talking here about the complaining and the, and the committing of evil when there was no need for it. We were told we would be victorious. We were told that don't depart, you know, um, Heard a talk this morning about sheep and goats and you we're told how to be we're told to be sheep and to be happy in the pasture that we're put in because god's got a plan and he's gonna deliver it and um and unfortunately mankind wants to compromise and uh and and taste things that they shouldn't back to numbers chapter 14 getting towards the end here numbers chapter 14 So, that's sort of a little bit of forgotten part of the story of the spies. And um, this is, you know, in the next chapter, the spies in verse uh, 39 of Numbers 14. And it says, Then Moses told these words to all the children of Israel and the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain saying, here we are and we will go up to the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. And Moses said, now why do you trans transgress the command of the Lord? For this will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be defeated by the enemies. Uh, for the Lord is not among you. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned away from the Lord, and the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop, nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came back down and attacked them and drove them back as far as Hormah. So here we see this futile attempt to invade the promised land on their own terms after they rejected the Lord, after they said, no, your promise isn't real. You know, we don't believe it. Um, we can't overcome. And um, after the, you know, the judgment of the Lord came down about, you know, no one's going to see it. Almost no one's going to see the promised land because of your lack of faith. And uh, it's the same in this world today. There's so many people are trying to take a different way in it, trying to follow a different path to get the same result. And yet God says, I'm not with you. And um, won't turn to it for time, but in Matthew chapter 7, it says that many will call him Lord, Lord, and say they've done things in his name, and, and he will say that he doesn't know them. And so just because you're out there saying you're doing the work of the Lord or doing some things that resemble the work of the Lord, following some of the instructions and not all, doesn't mean that on that day he's going to 
say, you know, welcome in. He's, you know, there is a day of judgment coming. He's not going to strike us down every day if we put a foot wrong. He's actually loving. He's giving us a chance um, during this 40 days symbolically time of tr testing um, that, you know, we can we can walk strongly in the path of the Lord. And if we we stumble or fall, there's still time. There's still time for us to correct our ways and, and get back on track. But there's people out there that are their whole lives are devoted to going about it their way. And it's just not going to work. Um, and we know when it comes to salvation and the way of the Lord, you know, <clears throat> about the requirement to receive the Holy Spirit, about in Romans 8 verse 9, about uh, you need the Spirit of Christ. And turn to Hebrews chapter 6 uh, while I'm talking about this. So we need the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And uh, that's how it's even possible for us to have a chance at following the Lord's ways because he's put his spirit in with us in within us and given us the opportunity to to walk in it and have that power behind us that can do things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do and overcome so in Hebrews 6 verse 13 um, so verse 13, for when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. Uh, and it's telling us, you know, the, the God who's promised us these things, he's the head of honcho, there's, there's, no one, there's no one above him in terms of integrity. And there's a word I think called immutable, you know, that he can't change, he can't flip. And... So when you consider all these characteristics of God, that he sticks by his promise, he's not going to change it. You know, we see wonderful things. And verse 14, saying, surely blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. And again, the waiting period that he specifically pulls out here in these verses, that there was a promise a great promise and that there was patient enduring in between the promise given and the promise delivered. And so we, we can't forget that. We still need to have those um, fruits of spirit that around patience and endurance and long suffering. We still need to have that. Um, and time is a killer of those things, you know, because many people start off in a walk and just time makes them believe that it's not real and it's not going to happen. But the Lord said they'll be enduring and, and there would be time, a passage of time between the promise and the delivering of the promise. So why are we surprised? You know, why does it one day we give up because ah, this isn't real when we're actually walking the enduring walk that he's called us to? Um, time passing doesn't mean anything about whether the promise is coming or not. It's going to happen. And in verse... Uh, Keep going here in 16 for men indeed swear by the greater and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of all dispute thus god determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of a promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things actually i'll read this in the amplified i found it a little bit clearer because it's referring to things that were already said, but sometimes you're not clear what, what it's talking about. So in the Amplified, by the way, does everyone know there's two Amplifieds now, so, you know, a few years ago, and that there's a dodgy one and there's a the one we've always used. <laughs> I think it's called the Amplified Classic is the one that we recommend to look at. Um, so it says in the Amplified Classic, this was so that, this is verse 18, this was so that by two unchangeable things, his promise and his oath, in which it is impossible for God ever to prove false or deceive us, we who have fled to him for refuge might have mighty indwelling strength and strong encouragement to grasp and hold fast the hope appointed for us and set before us. So it's the promise and the oath. And he's sort of saying they, 
didn't have to do those things, but you know, we do those things. We make promises and oaths and can't stand by them. But he's saying he can stand, he will stand by them. He's immutable. And verse, and now it goes into how is that possible for us, you know, uh, verse 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So it talks there about Jesus Christ going into that place and you might think, well, was he, in, was he invading the place? You know, we talked a lot about borders and stuff. But no, the, the plan of God was always that his son would become a sacrifice so that we could actually have the Holy Spirit indwelling. And that's through Jesus. You know, we know the, the New Testament scriptures about the veil and we don't have time to go into it. But going past the veil into the Holy of Holies, and now we have a connection not just a connection to the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit indwelling us. Um, and that's how he's established this new covenant with us, the promise he's sealed with us. You know, it's called a, um, a down payment in the New Testament. You know, uh, there's other words, but they're not coming to mind. But, you know, it's a, it's a down payment. It's a sealing of his promise that he's put the Holy Spirit in us. And so now we can be sure. And... Um, in actually in verse 9 is it 19 yeah so um it says in the amplified again it says now we have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul it cannot slip and it cannot break down under whoever steps out upon it so no one can tread on it no one can invade your promise and trample all over it and says continues there a hope that reaches farther and enters into the very certainty of the presence within the veil so all these verses are great um it's talking about a sure promise you know a certain thing and um not like that guy for faulty towers and if you've seen that show you know a sure thing and someone told him there's a horse that's going to win and uh you know these things are God's realm is just another level. Um, and so, again, you know, this was the plan of God for all time, that Jesus would, you know, make that veil torn and make that the Holy Spirit available to us. It's no longer this place we can't touch, we can't go. But that was the plan from the beginning, the promise from the beginning. And I um, guess, are we going to take hold of it and endure in our time of testing? Um, so that when the promise is delivered, we're on the right side of it. We, we're, we're, um, we're partakers of it is the word I was looking for, as, as opposed to looking on at, at the victory being won, you know, and all those people, the children of Israel, what was it? Two and a half million of them or something like that, that perished and two of them of that generation saw it and participated in but most didn't and you think about sort of matches up with this world that we're seeing the proportion of people that are just wanting to do it their own way either because that's just pleasures and lust and evil or because they've given up they once walked in the truth and they just can't they can't endure and they can't see the, the commitment of god to his promise so we'll leave it there and uh, we'll just have